The stories contained in this podcast are the recollections of the guests we've invited onto the show. We are an outlet for people to share their truths, and we accept no legal responsibilities for the stories contained herein. I'm Kendra Sheets. And I'm Rich Gill. And this is Enough, a podcast that aims to shine light into the darkened corners of the music industry while discussing the ways we can and should improve ourselves and in turn our community. This podcast may contain graphic descriptions of sexual abuse and assault, including rape. These accounts can be triggering, especially for those who have also experienced sexual trauma. If at any point during this podcast, you feel yourself getting triggered, we suggest taking a break and taking care of yourself before continuing. But we do ask that you continue if you are able. These conversations can be mentally and emotionally taxing, but they are so important to have. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Enough Podcast. Rich and I are here today with our guest, Lily. Lily, would you give us a little introduction about yourself and also how you got into music and how long you've been into the music scene, quote unquote? (laughs) Of course. Uh, My name is Lily. I grew up on the East Coast and my first real introduction to music was through One Direction and my friends and I on Tumblr we created like this joint account to like really fangirl over Harry Styles. So that was like my high school self. It died in March 2016 when One Direction had their great death. Rest in peace. I, <laughs> I, I remember that very well. I was managing a movie theater at the time and some of the gals who worked there. I feel like I remember the exact date. It was like March, I want to say 16th. I feel like that was the one, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> so after high school, I really got into college radio and I was a college radio DJ. I did a show with my friends and we focused almost exclusively on like women artists and their like contributions to a genre or like we would go more freeform with what our mood was doing, like or the holiday, really just freeform. I got really into it. I would like create zines for the station and create like digital content for Instagram and all that. That's super cool. It's also fun to hear that zine culture is something that has existed forever and still exists. Even in this purely digital world, people still make zines. And I, I just love that so much. Okay. So that sort of brings us up to the reason that you're here today to talk to us. If you want to kind of Give us a little bit of background on what exactly we're talking about today. So I'm talking about one of my experiences with an ex. I first ran into this person in high school, and we weren't really acquainted until a few years into college. We started talking almost exclusively online, and they were in a few local bands, and they would review sort of unreleased tracks for bands and like send them back with a little bit of feedback. So it was producer white, essentially. Uh, They were also really close with like sort of a upcoming emerging band in the punk scene, but they were still independent, still local, and still kind of small scale college level in terms of popularity. We started talking online in a very friendly way. But then we started dating in the fall of 2018. I was in college in the Midwest, and they were going to school out here on the East Coast, and they were also working at the same time, so we were essentially long distance within that first year. And within that first year, I had some idea of some red flags. They were very possessive of me and who I was friends with, But, you know, with the distance, it didn't really affect the relationship all too much. Because if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out. You're a million miles away from me. You can't really do anything about it. So within this time, things were good and kind of bare minimum. So, you know, obviously you're communicating online via, you know, text or... Text, Twitter. Were you also, like, seeing each other in person? Like, were you flying... Uh, back and forth? Back and forth. We It was usually an Amtrak thing. So Amtrak goes across the country. And so train was like the main way that we would go back and forth. And when you said that you saw the red flags, 
was it something where you see them more in hindsight or when they popped up you were able to kind of like hmm, that's interesting and kind of trick yourself out of thinking that it was more than it really was because that's something that i do so i was trying to kind of figure out you could have like this short little like doubt in your mind and then i Just like push it the, down yeah it was like everything is sunny everything is good you know when you're first getting to know somebody right so like you can definitely explain some things away because you know like hey they're a new person so i'm still learning who they are you know definitely and so we're dating throughout my last two years of college. And then because I graduated in 2020, I moved back home because of the pandemic. I had my partner, but we were both very cautious. And so we weren't really doing all too much until like the first wave of vaccinations. And at that point, I started suggesting we should go out more. I start pushing for a near, like a relationship that is very social and very like we go out on dates, we go do things together. I never really thought about that. If you start dating during a pandemic, you're with each other all the time and you're not doing the normal dating things like going out to a movie or going out to dinner, or hanging out with friends and yeah, it's very much like you're building a relationship inside like a very small space. I would describe them back then as like growing pains in terms of like the communication was weird and we weren't really like going on walks together or doing like just romantic things together it was just kind of like we were in the same space and trying to figure that out as someone who's been a serial cross-country dater for like a very long time there's definitely a huge difference in speaking to a phone or a computer it's not like you're uncomfortable with them being there in front of you. It's just a different dynamic when you're live in person. And I couldn't imagine being familiar with this person, then dating cross country, then moving back and basically being with them during the pandemic and being in such close quarters. And then being like, okay, it's time to experience the world together now. It's one thing we haven't had a chance to do, despite the fact we've been together for years. That's exactly my experience is I was just trying to like, create my perception of a relationship in a pandemic it wasn't really working out and so this is where i try to separate relationship slights from outright abuses because there were a lot of things that like led up to the environment where i could be abused but there are things that i believe that this person can change about themselves and moving forward so i'm gonna try and explain you know, what a wear down would look like of my boundaries and of my consent. So one of these examples is I had a very broad understanding of what physical intimacy looked like. So the build up to sex is part of sex to me. Um, and like small acts of like reassurance, like holding hands and these small kind of nonverbal, slowly caring for each other makes me feel better about having sex and you know being in you know a physical relationship with someone and it is of my perception that for them any sort of physical touch that did not lead to specifically penetrative sex meant i wasn't being physically intimate and that in his words i was withholding intimacy from them so I remember this one instance when I was in their kitchen. It had been a long, like, week and day at work. And they were putting that, their hands on, like, my boobs and my butt. And I was just, I snapped at them. And I was like, I really don't want you doing that. When I first get home, and he told me in response, but that's what I like. And I remember walking away to the bathroom. And saying to him, but it doesn't matter what you want, it's my body. And so I go to the bathroom, I like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And so I come back and I try to divert the conversation to what I needed. I needed a, how are you? How was your day? How was work? Or even to say something like my name and then how are you? And they told me that to say my name 
was uncomfortable for them. And they justified it by saying it also makes them uncomfortable to say their name. That's, I've never, I've never heard that before. I have never heard that before either when it comes to, like, the person that you're in relationship with. Yeah. To be, like, uncomfortable with saying their name. That's bizarre. Yeah, I'm... You know, like, it sends me into a confusion spiral every time I think about it. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah. Yeah. When, like, reflecting on it now, it felt like a way to, like, dehumanize me, but in a way that is filtered through the language of, this is uncomfortable for me, or, like, this is a boundary. <laughs> and I don't know how to deal with that now. It felt very, if I can bring it to, like, a modern-day example, which is, like, the Jonah Hill thing, where it's, like, this is my boundary. My boundary is I can't use your name because it makes me uncomfortable. Or I can't not touch you after a long day at work because it makes me uncomfortable. It's very hard to deal with. Right. I also just want to quickly add for everyone who's listening, being able to, in 2020, three years ago, so you were younger than you are currently, obviously, to have the personal wherewithal, you know, you, you stated that you weren't quite sure about the physical intimacy, you weren't quite sure exactly how to verbally state some of the things you needed, but just to even key up that conversation to this other person and say, hey, this makes me feel uncomfortable, I'm looking more for these type of things, is a huge step for someone at any age, and specifically, you know, at, at the age that you were during that time frame. That, that's really big, and it's very mature of you. I don't even know if I have some of those conversations at this age that I am now. So <laughs> I was going to say the exact same thing at almost 44. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have either. I'm incredibly impressed by not just you, but this whole younger generation of normalizing conversations like this. And these conversations are tough because you are dealing directly with another person that you're in a relationship with, which are always tough in regards to kind of coming to some sort of communication that both sides are sitting down and wanting to understand the other side, or even just trying to tee up a conversation in which you think the other side will sit down and come to the table and try to understand what you're saying. That alone is very emotionally driven because think of all the things that could go wrong. You know, they're going to misunderstand. They're going to get defensive. Everyone has, is carrying their own trauma and their own baggage. And you're in the situation in a pandemic where everyone is like one wrong breath away from having a meltdown at any moment. Yeah. On that note of like, we're having these conversations nowadays. So I went to a predominantly women's college and like this, this conversations that we're having in like the first class like orientation, because most of the women's colleges, like historically women's colleges are across the street from a campus with like either mostly men or it is co-ed, but you're usually paired up with that big school. And one of the things that's like the first thing that you talk about is the ways in which the schools across the street have covered up a lot of sexual assaults and misconduct. If it was like the perpetrator of something and a survivor, they would get like a jury of the perpetrator's peers to kind of peer review an individual case. And so it's something that I've always been aware of, but unfortunately hyper vigilant of when it comes to like interacting with groups of men. And this is something that I was very vocal with with this person, like, I was a very pronounced, like, feminist, very invested in, you know, standing up for women's rights and survivors in both academic settings and music settings. This is something that I've always been, like, communicating to them that this is something that I stand for. And it seemed that they agreed to, like, all these sorts of things. And again, I will say, because when I'm getting to this next story of major assault, it's just baffling because they had, like, kind of pushed themselves as this person who is a feminist, who is, you know, trying to fight for women's rights as well. It's just a shock, and I'm still, like, a little bit in denial today. How could this person do this? So, you're seeing some red flags. You're starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable with the way that this person is responding to you actually verbalizing what your needs are, what happens next? So 
I start noticing this kind of behavior in spring of 2021. I noticed that they would go a certain way about getting sex. I'd be spending the night at their place and I would wake up to them grinding on me. They would be naked, putting their penis on me, and I would be in a sort of groggy, like, half awake, half asleep state. So I would say, no thank you, or move physically away across the bed if I wasn't feeling it, if I wasn't in the mood. I would go back to sleep, and I would wake up to this again, over and over again, and I kind of internalized that if penetration would happen, this grinding would be over. Like, they would go to sleep. It would be done. This was happening every so often. Some nights I would, you know, like, say that extra no, and they would stop. But a lot of the times that I was over there, it would be this sort of same pattern of to get penetration, to get off. And so... After, like, talking with my therapist, my individual therapist, like, she encouraged me to, like, have a conversation about physical intimacy with them. And I remember that they, there was one particular day I went over there and, like, we start kissing. And I, like, stop to have this conversation, like, mid-getting things started. And I told them I wasn't feeling having sex. They went quiet for a little bit, saying, when you do this, this meaning kissing and then stopping and not doing sex afterwards, it makes me feel like you aren't attracted to me anymore. I told them that that isn't true and that I'm allowed to say no to sex at any time, like for any reason. I know what consent is. And it feels like manipulation when you say things like that where you're not attracted to me because you're not having sex with me. And I remember them going really just completely like a wall. They weren't even looking at me, just stonewall. And then, like, because it's so far away, I definitely have a lot of brain fog about, like, what happened after that. And it was just a lot of nights. It's hard to, like, quantify, like, just the amount of times where it would be this grinding and then stop if penetrative sex happened go to sleep you know everything was fine in my mind you know like everything would stop and we could just go to sleep and get it over with so there was that conversation that has like sat with me for nearly two years and i think it's always going to sit with me because it was so clear how he just didn't want to respect my consent in that moment and it's such a, like you said, it's such a manipulation tactic. You know, he's trying to guilt trip you into sex. Like, in order for me to feel that you're attracted to me, you have to have sex with me. Depending on what this person has gone through, maybe that is how they felt. But the conversation could continue to get to the next step where both of you are within a compromise. So they're understanding where you're coming from. You're understanding where they're coming from. And you reach somewhere in the middle where it's not just a, if you don't do what I want you to do, I feel this way, this is bad for me, and I don't know how I feel in this relationship, where then you feel off-put, like you have to, you know, overstep your own boundaries just to jump through the hoops of whenever this person wants sex, they get sex. Yeah, and it had to be a very specific sex. You know, like, say, I would want oral to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not going to be the kind of sex that goes on. It's only penetration. It's my way or the highway kind of deal. And also everything prior to that was just to get to that end point. That is right, the only exactly. end point. Making mm -hmm. out leads to sex, which is why I'm making out right now. Otherwise, we could just be having sex because that's the goal. That's what we want, you know? So you said that this was sort of a pattern. Did there come a tipping point or kind of had a concrete realization of this has gone beyond just, you know, making me feel bad? Yeah, the point where it was just, in my mind, a bad sexual habit to where it turned into full-on assault in my mind. There was, like, this one particular story that, you know, I'm feeling nervous to tell just because I haven't actually said it in full gross detail before. So, in this night, 
in my head, the word rape flashed through my head. I remember being woken up to the same grinding and, you know, I tap my phone because it's like, I am like fully half asleep. Um, I tap my phone and I remember it being around 3.40 um, in the morning and I was pretty nonverbal at that point and really just too tired to say anything to this grinding. I couldn't even like move my body at all. I knew I didn't want to have sex and so penetration starts and I feel this sharp pain and I remember looking at the wall and like holding in my tears and just kind of being like, okay, I hope it's over soon. I hope it's over soon. Is this rape? Is this rape? No, it's not. It's your boyfriend. It can't be. It can't be that. It can't be that. I wanted to like say something so badly, but I was just feeling so weak and so tired. I can't say the like interaction lasted more than 15 minutes, but it felt like I was there for, I want to say like, it felt like an hour. It felt my body was like so heavy and I glued to the bed. I just was so confused that, you know, the fact that my boyfriend was, like, doing this to me. After this happened, I went downstairs to, like, pee, clean up, kind of get some space for myself. And I went out to their living room to, like, sit with their cat and just, like, look outside. And I remember, like, thinking that I wanted to leave, but it was just so late and I told myself I couldn't leave I was like it's too late let me just go back up to bed and you know I walk in there and they're fast asleep like nothing nothing I honestly feel like I can't remember what happened the morning after that I just I think I remember going to work but I was honestly on autopilot after that night I felt like I couldn't tell anyone this word, the word rape. I couldn't tell my friends, I couldn't tell my family, like, because it would shatter not only, like, my relationship to this person, but also, like, my understanding of what I would allow in a relationship. I felt like I couldn't go to my therapist about it because they're, like, a mandated reporter, and I was like, you know, I don't want to call the police on this person. I'm like, no, um... I felt like if I was more vocal with this, like the word rape to this person, I felt like no one was going to believe me because they had like this public persona of being a great guy, good friend, funny, like sort of all like these positive things. And me saying that word about them would just like completely underline everything so i felt like i couldn't tell anybody it was just something that i had to sit with on my own it was hard we've talked to a lot of people who have been in similar situations and the thing that a lot of them have in common is especially in, in an instance like this where it's someone you're in a relationship with the reason you don't want to tell other people or go to the police or tell your therapist or anyone else is because you're concerned about the other person and not even thinking about yourself at that point. And also there's that idea like where you're saying that you know, they had so many positive things to their public persona just because someone knows someone in one way, even if it's a relationship, doesn't mean that you know the person that's in the relationship with this other person currently. You don't ever know what version this person is presenting public persona, private persona, just because they didn't assault someone in a previous relationship doesn't mean that they're not doing something, you know, in the current relationship. People change and our actions are not always, you know, synonymous with what the public version of themselves is representative of. Because they had such like a wide, you know, friendship net, I felt like this will like send shockwaves. And I really didn't want to do that to another person. Even though that they did this thing to me, I'm like, but I don't want to have someone's life be completely altered because of this word. I don't know. Even though at the same time, like, your life is completely yeah. altered now. 
I wasn't even like thinking about. You well, know, like, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like either you're not thinking of how it's affecting you, or you're just like, well, if it's just me, I can do what I have to do with this. If I make it public, then it affects so many other people, and it's it's really heartbreaking to hear stuff like that sometimes because then you're just sort of living with that on your own. And yeah. that's extremely difficult. So with that, it was like a few weeks after that, that I proposed the idea of a break. And that was initially the idea, but then he proposed the idea of a breakup. And it was pretty messy, you know, like as a lot of breakups are. Also, it's very hard to like transition between having this breakup with this person and then moving to Chicago. So after, you know, we break up, my friend floats this idea to me to move out. And this is kind of like the fresh start that I really needed. And so we find a place to, you know, really get us settled there first. And then we're going to look for an actual apartment after. So I make the decision to meet up with this partner one more time to like say bye and hopefully kind of like get everything in order because I felt like so like jumbled up from the way things ended. And I remember in that conversation, them telling me that it was difficult to say no to having me over. And sometimes that they just shut their feelings down for months at a time and that the sex was just instant gratification for them. And I responded to only one part where I told them that the same way it was difficult for them to say no to having me over. It felt like I was put in a position where I could not say no to sex, that I could only say yes at the expense of like a real relationship that was, you know, communicative and bare minimum and normal. Now that I'm over 25, it feels that response I gave was watered down to spare their feelings. And it really wasn't an issue of yes or no. It was an issue of obtaining and creating like informed consent across the board. Um, and I really severely wish that my denial didn't let me do it. The desire to like have a relationship with this person prevented me from really speaking my truth for a long time because, you know, I wanted to have a, you know, a normal relationship with this person based in trust. And the fact that they would go do these things through like, like a wrench. Was this one of your first serious relationships or? I'll say no. Um, I had been in a few relationships prior to that. Most of them only lasting like four months, I think. The longest one that lasted was maybe a year, but this was like my first years long relationship. So to have this as like your first sort of longer term relationship, did that kind of like sour you on future relationships for a time? I'd say my guard was definitely up in my next relationship. I was really nervous that, you know, like they're going to go and do this to me, but I consider myself to be a very forgiving person. Like, I believe in people's ability to be better and to change and within the things that are within our control. But I really do believe in people and I really do like people. And just because it was just like this one person who did this, I can't say I've sworn off everybody else. That's Which good, though. Great. That's, a, that's yeah. a good place to be. <laughs> totally. So you've ended the relationship. You moved across the country, or at least part of the country. You're halfway but across from where across, you were before. Good point. Yeah. And you have a fresh start, but there are some things that have kind of cropped up again. There are some issues. Could you speak to some of the medical problems that start to arise during the relationship and then also post? Yeah. So when we were having the penetrative sex in, um, April, May of 2021, I started noticing this pain in my cervical area, my uterus. And so I kind of, because I know these things about sexual wellness, I'm like, 
It could be vaginismus. It could be vaginitis. It could be blah, blah, blah. And so I put my boots on and go to the gynecologist. I get a pap smear, I get screened, and everything is, they're fine. And, you know, I tell them that I'm having this pain. But they kind of hit me with that doctor response. Use a condom. Use lube. Take your time. Take your Tylenol. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, we'll do. We'll do, Doc. So, you know, I go through my breakup, and you're not supposed to have pap smears, like, too close together because it can mess with results. So I get my pap in October, and that one does come up abnormal. So they call me and say that based on my previous two paps, so this pap in October and the one I got back in April, I'm assuming that the one back in April was just outside the threshold of it being abnormal, and the second one kind of confirmed that something's wrong. And so... They call me in to get a cliposcopy and a biopsy of the cervical cells. Because I'm testing negative on all these screens and like these STI tests, which is like the most common cause of an abnormal pap, they're looking, you know, is this cervical cancer? And I am 23 years old and the word cancer, I'm like, huh? So in my head, it kind of clicks for me, like, this pain was exasperated during my relationship with this person. And so I'm like, hold on, are they, like, the cause of this sort of thing? So I tell them to go get tested, and they kind of give me, like, a non-response where it's like, yeah, sure, okay, you know, I'll do it eventually. And, yeah, so at that point, the periods of like not really responding get more frequent and we're not texting we're not talking and i have like this worry that it's going to be cancer and you're not helping me eliminate things so i'm like obviously like stressed out so during this time my doctor's on the east coast i'm in chicago so i'm flying back and forth back and forth back and forth and at this point, it's, I want to say, March of 2022, and that's when I go in to get my colonoscopy. And to prep for this procedure, they tell you to take a painkiller an hour before and to bring a pad, because there will be bleeding afterwards. And I remember from the procedure itself that it was just kind of like a scratching, like, like scraping against my cervix and afterwards I remember like having like cramps and it feeling like a period but also it feeling like a paper cut inside of me and the blood and the tissue like was it was just like a super visceral experience across the board. I'm glad you jumped in and you were able to explain what this was because there are some people especially our male listeners who probably don't know what this is. I know that some female listeners probably don't know what this is. I've had one as well, and you explained it in the exact way that it is, to beginning to end. It almost is like if you could take that nails on a chalkboard sound and shove that inside your body. That's what it feels like, and it, it is god-awful. And everything you've said is exactly what it is, which is exceedingly unfortunate, and it's a horrible thing that we have to go through. Yeah. Yeah, so... I want to say, like, maybe two weeks go by, and then we have our telehealth visit with my gynecologist, and the results were, I don't have cervical cancer, so great. But the gynecologist says that it wasn't actually my cervix that was inflamed, it was the area around the cervix, which is very difficult to pathologize. There's not a way to necessarily... <laughs> This is the root cause of this problem that you're having in your cervix or the area around your cervix. And they said, okay, we're going to prescribe you an anti-inflammatory. And that was kind of it with it. I can't say that the inflammation was necessarily caused by this partner, but I know it was the 
inflammation was worsened by kind of like this speedy rush into penetrative sex. And, you know, the inflammation would get like worse and worse the more frequent that this kind of penetrative quick sex would happen. As for, you know, what I have to do now is I have to be very careful when it comes to penetrative sex because the pain can kind of just come out of nowhere. Like sometimes it'll be fine and everything will be okay, but sometimes it's like instantly inflammation. So you're taking care of yourself. You're kind of moving slowly through intimacy. Are there other things that you're doing now, currently, post-relationship, in the healing phase, to kind of help yourself move forward, move out and away from what you had experienced before? Yeah, I'm doing my best to really be vocal with my experience with the sexual violence on an interpersonal level. So I'll usually like reach out to someone who I think is, you know, needs to be aware of this kind of like sexual violence that went on. And it's a difficult process, but it, I think it's really necessary in terms of making sure that this harm doesn't happen again. Usually the response is like one of three things. So you have ghosting, you have the kind of swift walk, and then you also have, you know, some people who are very accepting and very like understanding of this whole situation. It's usually people like satellite to this person, which I'm grateful for, but you know, I want to make sure that people closest are kind of aware that this is something that happened. So recently, I reached out to his bandmate directly after I heard Christina's story on this podcast because I was like, okay, it's time. It's time for my Me Too about my experience in the music scene. And I just want to scroll to like review what he said. This is all over text. So, what we're going to do now is. Lily has shared what the conversation is between herself and the bandmate that she reached out to. Rich will be acting the part of the bandmate, and Lily will be reading out what she has texted the person. It was text, correct? Yes, it was text. And scene. All right. Hey, bandmate. It's very evident to me that X has not changed or taken any accountability. I wanted this result two years ago, and I kept that door open for X, but it's very evident things have not changed. I'm going more public to more of the local venues because this hasn't been handled. I hear you, and I don't want to get in the way of what you need to do, but I also don't want to have this trace back to band one or the rest of band two, if it's possible to avoid it. Do you feel it would be helpful if I removed X from the situation as far as the band is concerned until there's some sort of closure on this? I'm just thinking of how I can be helpful while protecting others I work with. I'll put my thoughts together and get back to you. I reached out because it felt like the situation was getting too large to make any sort of change or offer any sort of healing. I know what you mean. I'm sure it's difficult to imagine at this point what specifically would offer that kind of healing. But if there's something in my power I can do, please let me know, because I don't want this stress for either of you, and I'd like to be able to find a path forward that includes some means of resolution. 24 hours later. Hey, I think I'm deciding that for the time being, what makes most sense from my end is to perform without X. I don't want to cause or exacerbate any issues, so I told him that's what I'm planning to do. I figured I should let you know what I'm thinking as well. I've kind of spent the day journaling, and my thought process is that for a time, I think X needs to be away from the group. I think I want actions taken to contribute to safe space efforts. I mentioned two small festivals. Uh, to open a donation line to Rain, and they agreed to look into it. This was when X was on to play. So to provide a little bit more context to this phone conversation, I had reached out to this small festival to let them know that this person sexually assaulted me, and they were like, okay, we'll talk with the bandmate. And you do kind of get, like, the general kind of PR response at first. And I was like, okay. And they said that this bandmate had urged X to reach out to me and to start that restorative dialogue. And I was like, great, awesome. Continued silence. And so I asked 
the small festival to say, hey, I really think you should reconsider putting X on the lineup because it's clear that things haven't changed. And they were, they responded with saying, you know, we've already sold tickets that kind of like have them on there. So I'm sorry, is there anything else we can do? And I was like, okay, fair enough. And then I said, is there any way, I know it's a small festival that you could set up a donation line to rain. And they were like, okay, we can do that. And I was like, thank you. So this phone conversation happened after that initial setting up the donation line, but before the festival actually took place. So as far as I know, they did not perform with X. So as it stands now, this person is out of the band. And I feel like moving forward, the restorative work that has to happen is kind of honesty about the assault from my abuser and reassurance that this person is not going to go out of their way to hide behind, you know, like their friendships or kind of their public persona moving forward. Restorative work for me personally is not about canceling or like shipping this person off to where they'll never like interact with another person ever again. It's about making sure that we can create like structures where we not only prevent the harm from happening in the first place, but also giving care to the survivors and the satellite survivors of harm. Healing happens in community and clarity with others. And I want survivors to be able to return to the scenes, places, and creative outlets that they really enjoy. You know, music has been a part of my life for so long now, just because this, you know, musician and like this band community has kind of silenced my experience. I don't want to walk away from like listening to music forever. It's hard to return to, I'll say, but it's not something that I want for myself. I don't want to not listen to music ever again. People who have been harmed shouldn't be the ones who have to leave the scene that or community that they've been a part of for, in some cases, the majority of their lives and found family and community and support. The abusers and people who have done harm are the ones who, like you said, we're not trying to like ship people off to a desert island or exile them from anything, but until you take accountability for what you've done and made some sort of effort at, you know, making amends in whatever form that takes, you don't get to be involved in this amazing, creative, vibrant community. Like Kendra has said before, I built this house. I lived in this house. I cleaned this house. I'm not leaving this house. I have a new one. <laughs> well, I'm not much of a sports person, the idea I don't think is ever to just remove someone completely from their support system. You don't want that for the survivor and you don't really want that for the abuser either because how are they going to learn? I mean, if we just take them out of an area and transplant them somewhere else, they're still going to have the exact same behaviors within whatever other community they drop themselves into. It's kind of like, and here we go. It's like the house thing, Rich. It's like we're all kind of players in the game, right? We're all part of this. We're not going anywhere, but we may need to have some people sit on the bench while all the rest of us are still playing a little bit so they can get their shit together and then we can tag them back in. And as I said, I'm not a big sports person, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's how baseball works. So. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for sharing with us. Is there anything that you want to add or just mention on a positive note about your experience or where you're at now just to kind of leave everyone um, with, with some positivity? Yeah, I love my new home in Chicago. It's a great, wonderful place, very vibrant, very creative for me. I really enjoy the job that I'm working. It really gives me the opportunity to not only share my creativity with like the next generation, it also gives me a space where I can, you know, feel like my old self again, where I can say what I please, you know? And I also really appreciate that I got a promotion this year. I also greatly appreciate the chance that I got to speak with you both um, about my experience. It's really healing for me to speak up to not only people in the small community, but to people at large, you know? 
I can only hope that other survivors continue to find strength in each other long term. Enough is a podcast centering on surviving abuse, harassment, and assault in the music scene. To help get the word out, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. If you have been on the receiving end of harm from someone, be it artist, venue owner, booking agent, audience member, or someone else, and would like to share your story on a future episode, please reach out to us at thisisenoughpodcast at gmail.com. All correspondences are kept confidential. 